Hello everyone and welcome to Edip Search Clinics. I am Dr. Gunjan Desai. And today we are going to discuss a very important complication after pancreatic surgery especially and that is delayed gastric emptying. And we are going to focus on its risk factors as well as the strategies for prevention. So in this talk on delayed gastric emptying, we will look at the definition and the types of delayed gastric emptying the ISGPS definition, the grades, primary and secondary DGE and clinically relevant DGE. We'll look at the risk factors in pre-operative, intra-operative phases and look at the predictive scores. We will see the evidence on what are the probable risk factors for DGE and accordingly the strategies of prevention can be devised. The various studies on this topic will be discussed in brief. And finally, we will discuss the prevention and mitigation strategies, including prehabilitation, the role of standardization of surgery, the role of duct to mucosa PJ, enhanced recovery after surgery, and the important point to rule out secondary delayed gastric emptying, as that has a very different management algorithm, as we will see in this video. So, the scope of this presentation is limited to post Whipple procedure delayed gastric emptying. So, the other causes of delayed gastric emptying are not taken into account here. So, when we see definition of delayed gastric emptying, this is the standard definition that most of you would have seen. That is the grading of DG and the definition four to seven days of nasogastric tube requirement or reinsertion of nasogastric tube after post-operative day 3 is DG grade A. In these patients, there is inability to tolerate solid oral intake by post-operative day 7 with or without vomiting and gastric distension and use of prokinetics. For DG grade B, the Duration of nasogastric tube requirement is 8 to 14 days or reinsertion after postoperative day 7. And for grade C, it is more than 14 days or reinsertion after 14 days. So, unable to tolerate solid oral intake by postoperative day 21. So, you can see that if the definition is in multiples of 7, grade A is 7 days, grade B is 14 days and grade C is 21 days. That is the upper limit of DG for these grades. However, when we look at the grading, it is also something that defines the management. So, in patients who have grade A DG, the clinical condition is good and probable comorbidities are not present. They may be on prokinetic drugs, but no other treatment is required. Diagnostic evaluation and interventional treatment is usually not required in grade A. They may have a prolongation of hospital stay, but delay of adjuvant therapy is not there because the duration is less than seven days. In grade B, in comparison to grade A, these patients may have diagnostic evaluation like endoscopy or upper GI contrast study or CT, and they may need parenteral nutrition or reinsertion of nasogastric tube. It is grade C where we are more worried because these patients have delay of potential adjuvant therapy. They may need treatments like abscess drainage, relaprotomy or relaprotomy for any other complication or need for total parenteral nutrition. And that is why grade B and C is what is known as clinically relevant DG or CI DG as per the latest studies, right? So, ISGPS grading is grade A, B, and C and the definition that we saw, whereas grade B and C is known as clinically relevant DG, right? Now, coming to this recent concept of primary and secondary DG, this has been summarized in the article as mentioned in the slide below. Primary DGE is less common than secondary DGE. This is very important, commonly as the MCQ also. The incidence of DG is 19 to 57% of which primary is only 28% and secondary is around 72%. Also important to understand is that secondary DG is, as the term suggests, a consequent event to development of another complication such as perigastric collection, post-operative pancreatic fistula or hemorrhage, chyle leak, bile leak or GI leak. So, any anastomotic leak or collection in the area of perigastric region 
can lead to delayed gastric emptying and this is known as secondary DGE. If none of these factors are present, then it is known as primary DGE, right? So this is the concept of primary and secondary DGE. Now, when we come to risk factors or prediction factors, there are few important scores that give us an idea of what the different risk factors are. So one of the scores is this predict DGE score, okay, where PR is procedures, E is erythrocyte, that is preoperative RBC transfusion. No biliary stent is called less. Invagination technique is called less. COPD is a risk factor. Non-smoker is called less. Okay. High risk is greater than or equal to 5 or greater than 4. So if the score of your patient is more than 4, then there is a high risk that the patient can have DG. Okay. Venous reconstruction or vascular reconstruction is also a risk factor intraoperatively. Age greater than 70, male gender and ESA more than or equal to 3 is also a risk factor. So all these risk factors are risk factors for development of DG. Coming to another score, okay, where the factors are more intraoperative and postoperative as compared to the predictive score where the factors are more preoperative. The different factors in this score, okay, again, a publication in 2023 is given by this PUMCH CRDG, that is Clinically Relevant DGE Risk Stratification Score. This is from Peking Union Medical College Hospital. The different scoring criteria are as mentioned in the slide. Blood transfusion, again, is a risk factor. Minimal invasive pancreatic surgery is a protective factor. Intraabdominal infection is a risk factor. Incisional infection is a risk factor. And clinically relevant postoperative pancreatic fistula is a risk factor. You can see that if patient has intraabdominal infection or incisional infection, the scoring rate by itself is so high that these patients are at moderate risk of DG. Right. So these scoring systems help us in understanding the various risk factors that our patient has and probably help in devising strategies for prevention. From other articles, the risk factors for primary and secondary DGE are as given on this slide. Primary DGE risk factors are smoking, also in secondary DGE. Blood loss and blood transfusion are risk factors for both. Soft pancreatic texture is a risk factor for both. MPD less than 3 mm is a risk factor for pancreatic fistula and so a risk factor for secondary DGE. Pylorus preservation is protective in primary DG, but a risk factor in secondary DG. So this is how these studies devise the risk factors. Now going into prevention strategies, once we know the risk factors, there are preoperative factors, intraoperative factors, and some postoperative factors which can help us in preventing delayed gastric emptying. Preoperative factors based on the risk factors such as smoking, COPD, age greater than 70, anemia, preoperative stenting. These are the risk factors that we have seen. So preoperative factors are prehabilitation, that is smoking cessation, COPD management, anemia correction, stenting, if can be avoided, is a better option. So these are some of the prehabilitation strategies that can help in preventing delayed gastric emptying. Coming to intraoperative factors, there have been a lot of studies and we will see them in the upcoming slides. But is any of the strategy beneficial? We will see based on these studies. POPF risk score is important in intraoperative factors, which is dependent on the gland texture, indication of surgery, duct diameter and blood transfusion. Presence and absence of feeding tubes and drains and duration of surgery are also intraoperative risk factors for POPF and secondary DG. Coming to postoperative factors, enhanced recovery after surgery protocols have been shown to reduce DG. Nasojejunal or feeding jejunostomy tubes, if present, need to be managed properly. NG removal based on the postoperative course of the patient. Wound infection should be avoided or treated as early as possible and POPF management can all help in managing the DG, if especially in these cases, the DG is secondary DG. 
So now coming to the evidence, we will see some classic techniques that have been used to avoid DG, some clinical trials and their outcomes in very brief. So this is one study which is a randomized control trial and they studied classical Whipple versus pylorus preserving pancreatico duodenectomy. And if you see the incidence of DG, there is no significant difference in this study. Coming to another trial, which studied the type of anastomosis. So remember the previous trial studied classic versus pylorus preservation. This clinical trial RCT studied PG versus PJ. Again, in this study, short, small number of patients, okay, but there was no significant difference between the two arms in terms of incidence of morbidities as well as length of post-operative hospital stay. A rule loop reconstruction has been extensively studied for prevention of DGE as well as bile reflux. And this is one of the studies on a rule loop as a solution to DGE prevention. There were 28 patients of single loop and 16 patients of rule loop. And overall, if we see rise tube removal, initiation of liquid diet as well as hospital stay, the results were in favor of rule loop. Okay, so in this study, this is a single institute analysis where the results were in favor of a rule loop. Coming to brown anastomosis, which is a side-to-side -side anastomosis, there are two different studies, one in 2017, which is RCT, and then a meta-analysis in 2018 on brown anastomosis. No significant difference was seen in the RCT, whereas significant difference was seen in the meta-analysis on brown anastomosis. So as of now, for brown anastomosis, the data is divided, and that is why there is a BERP study or a brown entero enterostomy reconstruction after PD on delayed gastric emptying study. This study is a multicenter randomized control trial which started in 2022. It is ongoing and the results are expected in 2025. So, so far we have seen just to summarize classic versus pylorus preservation, no difference. PG versus PJ, no difference. Then we came to Rulu and brown anastomosis and brown has shown some benefit in a meta-analysis. That is why this brown endroendrostomy is being studied as a part of multicentral RCT and the results are expected in 2025. Now going to different techniques of surgery, laparoscopic, robotic and open. There is one RCT and there are 15 propensity score matching studies. There are similar rates between robotic and laparoscopic PD, but the rates were reduced as compared with open pancreatico duodenectomy. However, as of now, open PD is the standard of care and laparoscopic and robotic are still being studied and compared for oncological outcomes. So to summarize, DGE is an entity with multiple risk factors and evolving pathogenesis. If we understand the pathophysiology of primary and secondary DGE, we will come to know that pancreatic fistula and the risk factors of pancreatic fistula are the most important factors for secondary DGE. When we talk of mitigation strategies, we need to focus on prehabilitation, prevention of postoperative pancreatic fistula and a possible role of minimally invasive PD but data is still limited on this topic. Role of brown enteroentrostomy looks promising, but it is still under investigation. Thank you.